uh, we took the crown from Deloitte. That's probably it. And you got him right out of there. I don't think you disturbed him at all. Let's see if we can have ease up there and take that rainbow. Let me get in the low profile, maybe on my knees, so I won't get any, any disturbance on this fish. Maybe we can get him. Oh, yes. He's feeding all right. I can see that. First, it's important to get your line out and get ready before you start working a fish. You don't want to blow a cap. That's right. Oh, there he is. Good shot. Look at that. Now, folks, I think they showed up pretty good on the camera. You know, it's going to look like you took the drive shot. Yeah, but it did take a merger. The rainbow. Beautiful rainbow. I think it's right there since every month. It's got much fire. Kind of murky up the, the water a little bit, but. Ah, what a beautiful rainbow. See if you can see the rest, so you can see. Oh, it was right here in the corner of the map, just like the rest of it. Now let's get this boy back in the water. Yeah. Well, we have quite a great deal of good luck in the stream trying to collect some samples. And as you notice, the predominant species in this particular stretch of river is the caddis flies. We have a lot of caddis pupas. We have a lot of caddis larvae. And some in case, right here, perhaps we have also some uh, water earthworms. You have some PMDs. You have some stone flies. There's a golden stone flies, like the lime flally style. And even a leech which managed to collect. This is also another caddis larva. There's different tones in this caddis larva. Some of them are olive. Some of them are a little bit in the brown size. Uh, it is such a large variety that it will be hard to describe all in one segment of a show. But we're going to attempt to match this to some of the flies we have tied. Let's take a look at some of those flies now, Oscar. All right. These flies over here are meant to represent all the three stages of the metamorphosis of the caddis fly. First, we have a larva, and the most predominant color is an olive. So this is what we, exactly what we have here. Then you have a pupation stage in the metamorphosis, which it would be the stage in which they grow their wings, and they would be just ready to hatch. Otherwise, they're called emergers. Then we have, of course, the adults, which are the dry fly. Um, and you have two different styles in here. But the most important part about all this is that you can represent accurately each stage of the metamorphosis of the caddis fly. Here we have the encased caddis, both in the stone and the stick side. And then you have also a free floating larva, and perhaps one of the uh, net weavers. Now, this one could be easily compared to this larva over here. Then we can also have in here, of course, your emerging pupas. And this one easily can be compared to this one over here. And over here we have, of course, the uh, adults. And the adults that we have in here, of course, they got wet, so they compare very well in this case. But trust me, when you see them on the stream next, you'll see how close they come to resemble them. And these, of course, are the dry ones.
Now I understand that you uh, save these samples? Yes, I like to take some of the samples home label and put them in a zero container. So for later, I can show them in my classes and I can study myself to further imitate this insect as close as I can to what nature produces. Now, why don't we go back to the fly tying room and show these people how to tie these flies, Oscar. Explain a little bit about your techniques, your patterns, and how you construct them. Sounds like a good idea to me. I'd like to start by showing how to tie a caddis fly. First, I remove the barb of every hook that I use for three different reasons. One of them is it's easier to hook the fish when there's no barb to obstruct penetration. Second one is you don't hurt the fish once you hook him. And the third and very important one, if you happen to hook yourself, you can always remove them simply and you don't need the help of a doctor to do so. So we remove it with a pliers just simply by compressing the barb against its own chunk of hook. And that's how we start. Now, the fly I'm about to tie requires for me to put a bead. This is a very, very small glass bead, very difficult to see. And I'm going to thread it. And also, when you remove the barb, it makes it so much easier to pull the bead onto the hook. Just like that. Then you slide it, just like this, to the top. Now, we are ready to put it on the vise. Once it's secure in the vise, we'll put our glasses so we can see what we're doing. And then we proceed to wrap the thread from behind the bead all the way to the middle bend in the chunk of a hook, just like so. Make sure your wrappings are nice and tight and secure because this will ensure that the material will not slide. When we get there, we just trim the access thread there. The next material is either liquid lace, larva lace, Either one of those two materials are perfect for this, this nymph. And we must trim this in an angle by cutting with the scissors and creating a point. That will ensure that the will, material will be tied without having much of a bulk. So we take this to the bent of a hook, right there, and we secure it with a thread, just like that and we'll give it several wraps to ensure the material will not move just like this. Very good. Yes. Once we feel that we have the material secure, we'll find the next process, which is the dubbing process. For that, we need some rabbit hair. This is the soft part of the belly of a rabbit. And we will use this to create the fibers that will come through the wrappings of the larva lace. By using a little bit of dabbing wax, you put the bed on your fingers. Then you do a very loose dabbing. Little dab at a time, just like that. You can slide it up the hook. A little more until you create or you add all the material you need for the fly. It's better to do a little bit at a time, not to do big bunches, because if you put too much, it's more difficult to take it out. And you want to do it loosely, so you show the fibers. When you think you have enough amount, you'll wrap this back all the way to the bend of a hook and meet the other material. Here it is. Now, I got there, but I think I need more, so I will use some more, since I still have some wax in my fingers. I continue to do the loose dabbing, which will be compressed afterwards by the larva lace. 
And now we come forward and try to create a taper. So in the front of the torus of the fly will be thicker and it will be a skinnier towards the back. With my fingers, I'll accommodate the materials backwards, just like so. There and there. Once that's done, then I can now wrap the larva lace or the liquid lace forward. We must allow some of the larva lace material to show through to create the fibers, which in the covers in the caddis fly, the caddis larva, are the gills of such a fly. With my fingernail, I'll help the material in place and continue to wrap. As you see, we're using the whole entire curvature of the bend of a hook. And you can see the fiber starting to show up right through the fly. That's exactly what we need to have. And now we just can go forward until we get to about nearly or a little bit more than two thirds of a chunk of a hook just like so. And then we can wrap with a thread. And what I'm using today is the super fine thread, which allow me to do use as much as I want to without making a bulky fly. Now that I have finished putting the liquid or larva lace in it, I will trim all this rabbit hair that will let it show through. We just can rotate this vise any way you want to, to be able to rotate. So we're gonna turn this upside down and we'll start trimming. Well, make sure that we got little stubby little things showing up all over the place. Try not to cut the thread. We turn this, turn, turn, Yes. Until you think you have the right amount of rubber hair showing, you can take the rest of it, remove it with your fingers like this. There. And now we're ready for the best material I have worked with in years. It's called New Dub. I have a strand out. And I will pick up the strength and attach it to the top of a hook, right behind the bead head. So there it is. We give it a couple of wraps to make sure she stays secure, right there. And we place it here in the holder, turn the hook upside down, and we're ready to use the next material, which is deer hair. Just a little bunch and pull them. Then we will place them right behind the bead head. Just by doing so, we use both hands. Just like that. We keep it underneath. Give it one or two wraps. It flares out there. See that? Then we find our scissors and trim all what we need to use. And we remove it. So we have just a few of those hairs remaining on the hook, just like that. Now, we will take this and give the first wrap by putting forward that and we'll wrap about twice just like so then we turn the hook the hairs forward and wrap right behind right behind the bead there just like that see how easy it is to use this new dub 
it saves you time and it makes the fly look so nice and clean. When I take about two rounds of this, I will cut the rest of the new dove and whatever else I don't want there. In this case, it's a little hair right here. I don't want that. That goes out. There. Now, we will we finish. And the fly will be done, except for trimming the legs. So we go one, two, three. That's really all it takes to finish that. Now, we'll trim that. And we're going to roll the fly just to take a look, a close look at all the parts. Now we're ready to cut the legs off. And we'll put the scissors right here to the point of a hook and trim. I'm very, very concerned about having the right measurement, so I'll trim a little bit more until I'm certain that the fly has the look I want. And that is the caddis fly. I'll roll it slowly so you can see all the angles on the fly. What we're talking about by going from working in the bank, taking out. Now there's one other tool, Oscar, that we need to demonstrate. Oh, yes. And it's that's the stomach pump. Now we're going to confirm what these fish have been feeding on. First off, the pump makes sure it's smooth all the way around. If the edges are nice and smooth, you fill the pump with water, ease it in the fish's throat, ease it. The water is squirted in, it distends the stomach, and the food is sucked out. Now, once you have it out, get that fish back in the water, work him upstream. Yes, very important that the fish is preserved. And Just make trust. sure that he's ready yes. to go. He's gonna have him between my knees and here until he's ready to go, then he'll move up. He's looking for cover. Ah, look at this. Okay, now oh. you squirt the, the stomach contents out. Now look at the, the PMDs that he's ate, but look at all these caddis larvae in here, Oscar. Oh, there's plenty of them. It's unbelievable the amount. And we have not seen yet much caddis activity on top of them. But I've got to prove to you, the fish is so opportunistic that they feed on this larva. They look for this dry fly even when they're not fully hatched. We are tying the pupa. Basically, the fly is the same as the larva. I have already put on the bead, wrapped the thread back, dabbed the rabbit hair, and now I will wrap forward the liquid or larva lace, whichever you prefer. The procedure is the same. 
when things will change is after you really wrap this Vicuy or live alase because you will add the wing case, you will also add to it the legs and with it you need to use the fabulous material called New Dove. So first we finish this part right here, about two thirds of a hook. We're going to rotate this so we can see what we're doing right there. Now, with this ultra fine thread, we're going to finish off tying the lace. My sister will trim this off. Yes, like so. There. Now I'm going to wrap two more times to make sure that this is out of my way. And I am ready to trim all the hairs and fibers from the rabbit. And you can leave as much as you wish. I prefer to leave just little stubby things, just like that. A couple more, and then we are ready for the new dab. I have taken new dab out already the package. This is a neutral color which works wonderfully to make the thoracic section that wraps around the wing case. We'll take up a time and we will give him two wraps. One and two. And you can see the translucency of the material. It gives an immediate sparkle to the fly, which I really, really like, and I think the fish is one of the features that attract the fish to it. The next material to use is raffia or Swiss straw. This material can be parted with your hands, open up like so, and then you can peel a section that you need. Like so. Then you try to mold it with your fingers so it's a little, light little stick like this. Then, we will place it on top of the hook and we will secure with the ultra thread. So this is pointing downwards, like so. And this one over here, downwards this way. So they're in both sides of the fly. And then we'll wrap two or three times to make sure that they stay there. I will rotate a little bit so you can see how they point downwards, in both sides, downwards. Now, I will adjust the angle and use the new dove to secure this, and we'll tie it once, go over again, twice, and you can see immediately how it takes shape, and it's starting to look like the pupa. Then I'll rotate to make sure that I have both the underside and the bottom equally wrapped. And I will finish in this point with the ultra thread, making sure that I leave the new dove up on top. Rotate again. OK. The next material, it is a ring neck fastened rump. You can pick up any of these feathers, any of them, and just trim one out, such as this. Now, all you need is just a few fibers, so you can peel this fussy part of the feather because you won't use that. And then, taking a segment such as this, you will tie then this little tuft of rump feathers 
right underneath the fly. So we rotate the fly one more time. We put the legs angling backwards towards the point of the hook. And then we immediately secure them just like that. There. These extra feathers we will trim. We'll put a little bit on them to make sure we get them out of the way. We get the scissors and trim. There, just like that. Now we're ready to finish this segment of the fly by dropping the new dab two or three times, depends how many times you need to do it, to make sure you have a full coverage, both over and under the hook. Once you achieve that, then you can secure new dab right behind the bead head and you can trim just like that. The next material it is to use for antennas in this fly comes from the tail of a fasten. Any piece of material from the tail of a fasten you can use and simply take two, separate the fibers, and pick two of them. When you think you got what you want, you pull them out just like that. And they're ready to be attached. You need not to trim this. Just place them on top, like so. And you secure behind, there, behind the bead head. You wrap twice, and you trim. And then you're ready to whip finish. I always try to whip finish twice if possible. We'll see if we can do that twice in here also. There. One time. And I think we can do it one more time real swift. Just that. And that's that. Now you have the head attached right to the new dove. We'll trim in this side. And now you have the pupa almost completed except for the trimming of the wings. Now this is very important that we get a good cut in an angle. And if it's too much, you can always trim more, but there. And then from underneath, there. Now we turn this around and do the same thing to the other side. The first cut is an angle towards the back. And then we trim this right there to the front, and the fire is finished. Except that I like to get this antenna separated a little bit more. There we go, yes. Now, we'll have a full view of this emerging pupa. Now we're gonna conduct a stream seining of the creek that we're fishing today. And this is a standard stream seine that we use to kick screen in a river. Now this is a drift screen. This will tell you what nymphs, what emerging pupa, what adults are coming down the river. This is easy. All we do is take this and anchor it in a flow line, in a current line, and then we find a couple of decent sized rocks and just place them on the frame. And as the water flows through, it's gonna trap anything that's coming down, whether it's on the bottom or the top. Now, if you're in deeper water, as you can see, this thing does stand up and you can get some fairly deep water to do it. The kick saying 
is a little bit different. And what I'll do is hold the stain and, and Oscar and I are gonna do a kick screening. Okay. And we'll do it in a couple of different places in the river. All you can is to loosen up some of the gravel so we can dislodge some of the aquatic life that is holding on to the gravel. And then we get an idea of what is existing in the stream, what about the hatching, what is changing of the hatching cycle time. Now once you have conducted your first kick screen, you keep the net tipped as you pick it up. Well, we have a lot of uh, mayfly larva. Now in this particular seining, we've picked up a lot of mayfly larva and an aquatic earthworm up here. And what you want to do if you're trying to collect and identify to match the hatch, then you need to have something to put the insect life in that you've collected so you can take it back for later analysis. Stone, stone fly uh, right up by your hand, mm -hmm. up the top. Dr. Moody, you see? Yeah. Uh, got it flower, got it stick. The third stage of a caddis fly is the emerging pupa. We tie the pupa, now we tie an emerging pupa. That is the pupa that reached the surface and is about to break apart in the back. And of course, the first thing that comes out is the wing. So you're going to see all those parts take place. This is not a wet fly, even though it sets very close and flat in the surface. This is a floating fly. First material is a piece of fly foam. We will attach this to the end. And then you add it, it doesn't matter. There's no perfect way to do this. And then we're going to attach the ribbon, which is just this material. And you can use any material you wish for this particular part of the project. We'll attach this. But the most interesting part of this slide is the process of filling up the body. We will use a polydabbing. This is a neutral, um, pale olive. But instead of using the dabbing wax, we'll use a floatant. So the fly will have the floatant already inside. We'll put a dab in our finger here. Just like that, with a little oil. And we start the diving process. Just like that. And every once in a while, we put a little bit more oil. We touch the tip, put more oil. So we make sure that we have a very nice, fat, juicy body that the, the fish will be enticed to bite. Go all the way to the bend of a hook, tie several times, and that's just about right. Now, we bring the foam forward, which is going to give you a very smooth body, just like so. Not too tight, not too tight at all, just like that. Just like that. We'll trim this. Now, I'll rip with this material, try to get all that foam wrapped. Just like this, yes. 
This will stop the foam from coming apart when the fish bite on it. I turn the hook a little bit upside down so you can see better the process of doing this. Once you finish that, we trim this. Then as we did with the pupa, then we put a little bit more of this fly floatant, just like this. Touch it very nice. So when you get to the river, you're ready to fish. There. Now, we use the same raffia that we already trimmed one time and put the wings on it. First in the outside, always in the top. Then we bring this to this side and wrap it right there. Now, so far, it's the same process as the pupa. We're going to trim this right away. Just like that. We can trim this there, there, this other side the same way, there, and there. This is about right. Our next material is a polypropylene yarn. As we know, it floats. So we are going to place this on top of the hook here and secure it. Bring it back, like so. And we're going to wrap around several times so we secure the I want to make sure that it's all on top, just like that. Okay. The next part and the next material is a cool de canard dabbing, which is having to be a new thing for me. It comes in these nice little packages. And again, instead of using your regular um, wax, we're going to use this floater put the dab in our fingers. We already know that Cool de Canard has its own natural oils, but this will help the fly to float even better. Now, these fibers are kind of stiff and rather hard to use at time, but with all this oil, they should attach it right to the, right to the hook, just like that. And if we need more, then we just lift the package right here and take them out of the package. So, Cool de Canard happen to fly a lot. Any wing can make it fly, so we want to make sure we keep them in the package so we don't lose them. Then we start a process of winding this. We go in a V-shape behind the wing. We support the wing to stay up afloat, just like that. I'm going to put just a little bit more just to finish it off. There. One more time. Okay. Now this thing should float forever. Okay. Now it may look awkward to you, but remember that the fly is just coming out of the casing, so the casing is not very good. And with the scissors, we'll trim the top of this fly right here. So you see, it will look like it's coming out. It will have that very nice round situation. Now, if you want to trim some of this gold canide, you may, but it's not so necessary. Now, it is optional that you put antennas. I prefer to put antennas on it. The antennas, again, it is fiber from the tail of the ring neck basin. These fibers will separate them and use them as an antenna. This part of the fly is optional. If you decide not to put them on, it will be okay. Now, 
We'll tie them underneath with a quick loop, secure them, just like that. And we're going to trim right away the access fibers that we don't need. And now the trick is to open up these antennas in both sides of the fly. So they'll ride like that. So we pull them out and we hold them there. Yes. And now we are going to whip finish the fly but just like this. And if we do it twice, we don't need to use any glues. And there it is. We trim the excess material. There it is. So now we have an emerging caddis pupa. This is the last of the series in the caddis fly. We have tied the larva, the pupa, the emerging pupa. And now we need to tie what we consider to be the skidding caddis. Now, first, at a size 16 hook, we will start off with use every fly and start adding materials to it. Now, the special thing about this fly is the wing. When we get to that, I'll explain to you how the material came about. The first thing we do is pick up a good hackle and try to use a feather that is going to match the size of the hook. When you think you got them, just trim two of them and you can continue to work from there. Now, this is also going to be the antenna of this fly. So we're going to take away all this unnecessary particles of feather right out of there, just like that. Then we fill back a little bit more and we trim with our scissors, just like this. Turn it over. Now we will place the trim feather on the hook. We tie it on top of the hook in such a manner. And you will see why it has become also the antenna for the fly. There. We go back to the bend and we start the dubbing process. For that, we used 
a poly dubbing, and again, we will use the floating as a dabbing agent. You put a little dab in your fingers until you get, you see the, the shiny part, and, and dab away. I like to put lots of this, so when I get to the river, I'm ready to fish. And a little bit more of this material here at the end. There. And then we wind it on the hook. We'll start at the front and go back. Just to make sure we have the thickness we want. We want to make this fly nice and fat and juicy for the trout. Just like so. Then we need to use the rotating pliers, hackle plier that is, to wrap forward in a Palmer style the hackle. This will keep the fly floating high in the water and skittering on top of the surface, giving the action of an actual caddis fly when they are de depositing eggs. Once we're done, we just trim it out of there. Boom. That's it. The next material is a polypropylene ribbon used to tie gifts. Because it's made of polypropylene, it floats, so we'll cut a piece. Once the piece is cut, we fold it in half, lengthwise, and we crimp it with our nails, so it's very well barked. That's another property, holds its shape quite well. Then the first cut is up from there, like that. We turn it over, and the second cut is opposite, like that. And then, from there to the end, and there you have a wing for the caddis fly. Now we place this over and we measure it so we are sure that it's going to be at the right length of the eye of the hook. We'll mark it with our nail, bring it back, trim once, and then we must trim one more time to assure a good shape. There. And now we're ready to put this wing on the fly. Mount it on top and secure firmly. That's the first step of a caddis fly. Now what's left to do is to put the next of a hackle and also the antenna, as we did the other one, on top of the hook. We maintain that so they're parallel to each other. There. So they divide it one time, twice, there. Now it's starting to look like they belong there. The next step is taking our rotary hackle pliers, and as we did the other one, we'll wind this in a Parma style right behind the eye of a hook, right here. Now you can see how the fly is taking shape. It will be a very high floating fly with a lot of skidding in action. Do you think you have enough for this? Then you may wrap them. I'll rotate a little bit to see. Then put it back in place. After two wounds, we'll cut the rest of the feather out of there. There. Now, I will pick up the antennas and move them back. 
wrap in front of it, picking all the fibers you can, get them out of the eye of a hook, just like that. Then move the antennas forwards again, and using up our long width finisher, we'll do just that, finish our skittering caddis. Yes, once that out of there. Before you tie the string, make sure that you have this well out of the way and well open, just like that. We're going to do it one more time just to make sure. There. String. And then we are going to trim the antennas so that we'll have the right length. There. Now we'll remove excess hackle from the eye of the hook, and we have a finished skidding caddis. <laughs> Within the dry flies and the caddis, we need to tie a fly also that has a low profile. This is what I'm about to show you. It will dry low in the water so the trout will have a clear silhouette. There will be nothing to distort the clear silhouette of a caddis fly.
The ribbon material is the first thing that we'll put in. This ribbon material we used earlier to tie the emerging pupa. Well, this material is going to hold the rest of the foam and the polypropylene in place so it doesn't get ruined when the fish bite it. And the next material is this foam. It's called Fanta foam. It's a floating foam. We'll place it on top of the hook and tie it on. It doesn't really matter whether we make sure this is very neat or not. We just want to make sure that it's secure. Now, we are going to use some of this polypropylene material that we have in here. And again, we are going to use this floatant instead of using the wax. And like this, we are going to achieve immediate flotation on the fly because it will impregnate the polypropylene. These flies seem to be very heavy in the abdominal section, and we are going to make sure that they look that way. So if it looks fatter than any other cat you've seen before, it's meant to be that way. Okay. Now we should wrap this. Back to the bend of a hook. And we'll come back to the front, just about here. Then we are going to wrap this foam several times to achieve the shape that we want. As you notice, this foam can be a different color. This one is a cream color, but you can tie it with uh, olive, or you can tie it with a bright green if you care to tie them for the very tiny black wing caddises. So we're tying the, the beige wing caddis. We will use this cream color. Also, the segmentation would be a lot easier to see when you use this green material. And we'll try to pinch that foam right there, just exactly as it is. We hold it with a finger. And we continue to do that. Yes. Just like so. Exactly like that. There. When we have that in place, we use a pre-cut wing, which is made out of the material the polypropylene ribbon. We'll place this on top, and we tie, we secure it, just like so. Now, I like to put antennas on all my flies, so we are going to use this peccary that is in front of us. And we'll pick two fibers of this peccary, just like that and we'll make antennas out of them. First of all, we'll equalize them so they're even. Once we got them equal, we'll measure them. The same length of a fly will stay. Uh, this is the balancing point for the fly. This peccary will cause the fly to ride in balance at all times. It's not just the aesthetic looks of it, but also the riding of the waters. Once we have the flies in place, we'll use our scissors to cut the material we no longer need. Just like that. Now, for the color and the high flotation, I would use these two materials. This is a polypropylene dabbing. But this is a gray material, which is called a cool de canard dabbing. I will marry the two of them. Cool de canard will tend to loosen up, but this will hold them in place. When did you see? Again, we'll use some of this wonderful floating 
as the dabbing agent, and we take a little bit of cool decanard, we apply it just like that, and we'll start our process all the way down. We put a little bit more of this, and a little bit more cool decanard, and we put them on top, just like that. Now, with very little of this polypropylene, like this, will trap the cool de canard so it will be in shape always. This technique allows you to tie very small flies and make it look organized by using these two fibers. Once that's in place, then we proceed to wrap it. Just like so. It becomes almost like a little ball, then we'll separate the antennas with this. And then we'll whip finisher. Underneath the wing, underneath the antenna, we will pull the antennas back, then we will finish. Now this fly will float for an awful long time. It's constructed to float and it's constructed to last. I always like to wood finish twice to make sure that we don't need any glues. I try not to use glues on floating flies. Now we can put the antennas forward. We're going to trim the axis that we have in here. And I think the process is finished. Now let me see if I can show you this all the way around so you can get a good look at the low profile ribbon caddis. This is another way to use the low profile fly and the blue wing will represent the tiny little black caddis.
perhaps the fly that is copied the most often by most fly tires is the stone fly. There are several stone flies. There's golden stone flies and black stone flies for the major part of divisions. The Theranarsus, which the California Caliba West and the other one is in the Midwestern states, um, are a primary source of food for the trout. We like to do a Great Lakes style of a black stonefly or a Theranarsus. First, we dab a little bit of a ball of fur at the end of a hook. It doesn't quite matter which fur it is. Just a little bit will do. The whole purpose is to help divide the peccary fibers that are going to form the tail. What you feel you have, the amount necessary, then you can wind it like so. Then we use two pica coils or fibers, if you wish, or hairs. We made them equal. I'm going to measure about a half a shank of a hook, a bit more, and we tie them on top of the hook. Then we proceed to open them and wrap as we go to maintain those in other side of the hook shank. When we feel that we have got the separation we want, we can trim the rest of the fibers we are not using. Boom. The next fiber we shall use, it would be larva lace, liquid lace, nymph rib, any one of these materials will suffice for the job and we'll cut a little taper so it will be less bulky when we attach it to the bend of a hook. Just like that. Now, we'll go back and we'll attach the larva lace. I think you are very familiar with the next move, which it is to use some wax ribbon or dental floss or dental ribbon. And again, we're going to make a cigar shape with it. These flies have a very, very thick abdominal section and they're quite flat. So this material is perfect for what we intend to do. Just put plenty of tension so they won't slide, the material won't slide on it after you place them. Every once in a while you need to apply more pressure to make sure that that wax is fused together and help you to give the form that you want. Now it's going to take a little bit better shape of what I want him to do. The whole idea of tying these flies and taking the time to do them is that you want them to be as close as you can to the real thing. Now, if time is pressing, you can tie these other flies in more impressionistic styles, but I don't believe that you will have nearly as good of success in the river or the lake when you don't spend the time making it look realistic. There. Now, of course, with our flat pliers, we will crimp this. 
by crimping, we give them more of a flat look to them, which is essential for the stone flies. Now we must bring the thread forward, and we commence to we we'll start to wind the larva lace. And immediately you'll see the shape of the abdominal section. You don't need to put a lot of pressure on it. You just want them to stay one after the other together like this. When you think you have the desired amount, then you simply tie it off with this super strong thread. Tip it over. Got it. And finish. Now we're ready for the next material. And this material is a gift ribbon. And this ribbon we will cut in half. We cut here and then if we make one middle cut right here, we can cut the whole width of the ribbon. Separate them, just like that. Now we will fold this ribbon and make a tapered end on it. Now, we will attach this here. And that will become the three times segmented part of the wing case of a stone fly. Now, dabbing wax, put on my fingers and begin to tie. But first, we need to get a very loose a style of dubbing, very loose. Because if you look underneath the stone fly, you'll see the gills. And this is what this is supposed to imitate is the gills. So it's very important that you turn the fly upside down and take a look and see what you're doing. All right, once you get there, with the help of your dabbing needle, you will fold this. All right, you get it in place, you mark with your line right there, and let go. And then with the scissors, you make the appropriate cuts. They are going to take you to the next step. Now this is maybe difficult to do, if at first, but once you get the hang of it, you see it's not no different than anything or any other kind of fly you may tie. They all have a degree of difficulty, so that's this one. Okay, now, and it doesn't have to be that even. You just tie this and keep going back until you reach the point where you begin. Remember, you will flatten all this with the pliers later on, so don't worry about it if it's not exactly as you saw it should look at first. You have plenty of opportunity to correct this slide. That's, it takes a little longer to tie, but you have all the time in the world. And these flies will look a little fuzzy. You see, we look underneath again to make sure we have it. Then we fold the next segment back again. Make sure that it's nice and back. Then we dive a little bit more in front. Just like this. Get about two of these rounds of fur diving. Let's look underneath. Yes. That's exactly what I want. 
Okay. Now, again with the dubbing needle, we fold this about half the way to where the other one was, right about there. And then we're going to make our mark. Once that's done, we'll go through the process all over again. We will trim this like this. And it's easy if you turn it over. I made the second one. Always adjusting. If you think the fly is too wide, take a little bit more out of it. And then cut this way, like an hourglass. And this way. Okay. Now let's help ourselves with a needle again. And we'll tie this down. You can see how it's starting to form the shape of the fly. There's just a little bit here that I want to trim first. And I'll do it right now so we won't forget later. That's it. That's exactly what I want right there. Okay. Now, we must have a little bit more of this rabbit fur. We are almost to the head, so this is the part that is crucial because you need to realize that you are almost to the head of a fly. Otherwise, you'll surpass it and then your flies will be ruined. So with that behind once or twice, let's do it another time. Separate just a little bit more. There. One time and then one time in front. Okay. Now before we tie the last one, we're going to measure again with our dubbing needle and fold this and mark again. We're going to move forward just a little bit more. There. All right. We'll mark it. We'll fold it. Now we trim, but this is the last trimming we're going to do on this, so it has to be done right. A little bit different than the other one. I just want to make sure that I got And this one, a little bit more here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, we need to put some legs. And for that, we're going to use some deer hair, black deer hair. And I already took some and put them in this container. And they should be even by now. And we'll use them just as they are. It's to our advantage that fish don't count because we're going to put a whole bunch of legs for this. Time right and tap. Drop several times. And then we are going to trim all this fussy material. Try to get rid of all of it. If you miss one or two, don't worry. You can get them later. None of these flies are so rigid that if you don't do it now, you cannot prepare. Now, you want to split the leg to both sides. Like so. And wrap in between to keep separating them. We do it several times to want to make sure that we achieve this clearly. We have no problem with them later on. Oh. 
Okay. Now we need to fold forward, and with the help with an avenue, the last segment. It's not precise, so I may have to trim one more time. Let's take a look. Yes. I will trim one more time. Ah, I like this better. Okay. Now we're just about ready to make the head of the fly and put the antennas on it. Now this fly has no eyes. There's no room to put eyes the way I tie it. So I hope with the ones that really like eyes in the fly don't mind it, but I have no room for that. Yes. Now I'm going to fold this over and wrap right over it. Get those hairs out of my way. There. There we go. Okay. Now, for antennas, I chose peccary hairs or fibers or quails, whichever way you want it. Everybody calls it differently. And I want to make sure that those antennas are about the length of a chunk of a hook. This one were just about right. And I'm going to put one in each side. First, I just want to get them in place. Then I can move them around a little bit. They're very strong and very resilient. They don't break very easily. So you can move them around quite a bit. There it is. Once I get that achieved, I get my clippers and get rid of the axis because Peccaries and other fibers that are strong like that, they're terrible on your scissors. They'll take the, the sharp edge right off. Okay, now we just need to wrap a very beautiful big old hat on these flies because if you ever look at them in the wild, they do have a real huge head. I'm going to just uh, bury those quills for a minute. And we're just going to wrap over. The whole idea is to keep them divided and strong so they won't come out when the fish attacks. And when you put that many deer hair as legs, even if you lose two or three on every other fish you hook, you still have plenty of legs to go around, so it's a good way to do it. And this fly will stay the right side up at all times because it has that polypropylene material which makes it float right side up. Not to the top, but navigate the undercurrents the right side up. And because the deer hair was also tied at the top, and as you know, they both are floating materials. So that brings us to the point that when you use the right type of materials, you can make the fly do whatever you wish in the water, whatever size you want it to be up. You can do that. Now, after we do this, we're going to get our marker and dye the fly so you're going to have the bicolor which exists in the real fly. There's one more thing I like to do before I color it, and that is get my pliers again and flatten the head up because this fly is supposed to be flat, and this one won't break if you flatten them up. See? You can pick up some of these wings and pull them up if you want to, give them a little bit more of an edge or a silhouette. But those are just details that I don't, I'm not certain that everybody will spend the time doing, or the trout cares. Yeah. And one more time we'll flatten it. And now, here's my marker, black marker. And I pick up, first thing I die is the tail end, you know, that sticky thing there. There we go. Yes, there. And then. 
and we mark the rest of the fly. So now she's going to have the dual color that exists in all those uh, stone flies. And you can paint a little bit the tips if you want to there, just to give a little bit more of a look. Find it? Yes. And the head, of course. The top is black, so we're going to dye the top black. You can do the tip just to pronounce a little bit more. And if the little fiber shows through, no, it's not a problem. Just like that. Now I'm going to just mark the edges to make sure that they're visible. There. Let's take a look underneath, see if we need to do anything else. You see all those hairs in there? Well, I like those. In fact, I'm going to get my dabbing needle and get more, my dabbing twister, and get more of them out of there. So they really look like the, the fussy belly that the, or thorax, I should say, neither belly, the thorax that this fly have, just like that. Real nice and fussy, yes. And the last touch, of course, is our 60-second Hesment nail polish or whatever you can find that is available that cures fast. Also, this flight becomes quite durable because of this glue. The hair will be nice and fat, just like the one you find over there. And that's really all the glue you need. Now let's roll it a couple of times to dry it out properly. So that's in the stone fly, the third art that belongs to the Midwest. The Mrs. Shrimp is a minute organism that lives in most fresh water, but it's a high source of protein for most trout. I suggest that you should have one of this, or at least a half a dozen of them in your fly boxes. We will show you how to make one. The first step is to make the eyes. For that, we will use a monofilament. It's a fishing line, and with the lighter, we simply will melt a little balls of it like this. We let them dry and do the same thing all over in the other end. So we do it again just like this. Once that's done, we put it aside and we begin to tie our fly. I'll show you later how we use that. The first part is antennas, which are made out of crystal hair. This crystal flush of crystal hair will provide the antennas for us. Length of a shank of a hook. Tie it in. 
like so. Do two wraps and bring forward. to the bend of the hook. Then we can cut with scissors to the size we desire. There. This will be the next material, and it is a feather, bark color. You can choose whichever one you wish, such as this. You pick up just a few of these little fibers Just a few, just like this. And we apply it to the end of the hook. Give it two good wraps. We bring forward, there. And we have what would become the head of this Mrs. Shrimp. Okay. The next material, it is called raffia, or Swiss straw. We'll pick up a small segment and simply peel off. This will attach also to the bend of a hook. Just like that, over the top. And now, we'll put the eyes that we burned earlier. We'll simply attach this eye just by wrapping a couple of times. Now, we will cut this then we attach the second eye. So they're even at the bend of a hook. If they're not, we just simply tag on this part until they are. There. When you feel that they, you have them in the right place, we'll separate them in such a manner, just like that. And then the other side. And we'll trim the rest of the monofilament. The next material, it is my favorite of all. It's called New Dub. And this is mainly the whole part of the body. The whole entire body will be covered with New Dub. We'll attach it right in between the eyes. Just like that. and immediately will wind in between the eyes mm -hmm. and then the other way let's do it with my left hand so you can see in the camera there yes when we finish this one more wrap we bring the thread and secure, just like that. The next material, it is called crystal flash or crystal fibers. There's many of them in the market today. Well, this color is called root beer, and it'll match the rest of the color of the Mrs. Shrimp. We'll attach it here, and we'll get them out of the way. Now we pick up the new dove 
and draft form towards the eye of a hook. There. And we secure it with the ultra fine thread. We trim and we bring the raffia or switch stroke, whichever you decide to use, to the back, all the way to the eye of the hook. We give it two wraps with a ultra fine thread just to secure it, and we'll trim. Like this. There. Now we pick up our crystal flash or crystal hair and we segmentate the body by bringing it back. Mm -hmm. And now we secure it with a super fine, ultra fine thread. Excuse me. Trim. We use our whip finisher to finalize this fly. Yes, we remember if we whip finish, we need not to use glues. We do this process twice to ensure that all materials will remain just like that. We must trim this. And now, the last step, with a flat pliers, we will flatten the whole body of the shrimp. I prefer to use a black marker to be able to darken the eyes and this fly. Both sides to make sure they're very, very visible. Now let's take a look how the Mrs. Shrimp look all the way around.
Among all the aquatic life that provide fish with nourishment, there exists the crest bug, the salt bug, and in different rivers have different colorations. So this is just a way of tying the fly. You can adapt it to whatever coloration you want to. So I'm going to do a salt bug for you my style. It goes something like this. First material is a rump feather from a fasten, such as this. This we're going to clean all the fussy part of the feather, just like that. All of this that we are not going to use. So we have just this. Then we'll peel back so we have only the tip of the fasten feather to tie on the hook. Okay? And we'll tie it in this manner. Now, that's going to be actually the front of the sky. The next material we will put in here, it is called a scud back. A scud back, it is a material made out of a rubber, a stretchy, that is going to serve as the carpus of our scud. We will cut this in an angle and then do it again so, just like that. And we'll attach it on top of the hook. There. And place back. Now we can bring this feather and secure it. So all materials are going towards the end of the hook. Just like that. Once that's done, we need to add the weight. Just any lead wire will do. And we simply wrap it. We secure it with one hand, and we'll wrap with the other. About seven wrap, and you break. And then with my fingernails, I will accommodate it into the hook. Make sure that it's all bent all the way around and compacted. It'll take a couple of tries. There. Just like that. Then I put my thread over it, back and forth, to make sure she will stay in place. All these materials need to be in place. They cannot be moving around. So you use lots of this super thread, which is called ultra fine. Okay. The next material is something we are very familiar with, and we call new dab. New dab. It is a material that makes it easier for you to tie flies and create volume without having to do too much of work. The work is virtually done for you. So we'll tie this here on the side of a hook, just like that. And we need to build this. So we use some more of that super strong, ultra-fine thread. Okay, once that's done, then we need a flat pliers. Pliers that have no ridges in either side. And then we'll flatten this up. Such as that. The next material we're going to use, it is a Kevlar thread. Kevlar thread is very strong and it's been waxed. With the wax, 
you pass into Kevlar to make sure that it stays just as a continuous thread. There. And we'll tie it on. Kevlar is very, very strong. We're going to build with this Kevlar a little bit that body so it stays nice and flat for us. There. Now, we take our new dab and start winding towards the eye of a hook. Very close. Very, very close. One wound almost on top of the other. Need to build that body to be very nice and wide. So the scud will have more volume to it. You can see how it, it builds the body. This is a, and it gives you that beautiful sheen, that sparkle that I haven't been able to find in any other material but new dab. Once that's finished, just simply tie that, trim, and then with the plier once more, we're going to secure that it's a very flat fly. Just like that. Next, we bring this feather over separating, making sure we separate all the fibers. And we'll put it in place. And then we shall trim this with our clippers. There. Now, we know how much fiber we have to work with. The next thing we move forward is going to be the scud back. This elastic material, you go over the back, move the fibers forward so get out of the way. We simply wrap it a few times and cut. Get the fiber out of the way. Yes. Now, simply with the scissor, we stretch this and trim. A few more wraps to make sure that we have this in the right place. Yes. Now it's time to segmentate. For that, we need our dubbing needle and our Kevlar thread. And with the dubbing needle, we separate the fibers. Just like that. With the fingers, we secure the materials. We give it a very nice thought. We continue to do the same throughout the rest of the body of this fly. Again, separate. And make sure every time that you bring your feathers to the side. And we have one more of this. 
there. And let's go around the head twice. Then we secure with our ultra fine thread. Cut the cabler off. That's not quite, but almost finished. Now, we're going to use our whip finisher, and we shall do it twice. And we'll do it again. Then we'll trim. Get my pliers again, the flat pliers. And we flatten that body. And the trimming begins upside down. If you find fibers that you don't like, you just take them out. Any fibers you don't like. Okay. Cut here. Another cut here. Then we round off. So they have the right look. And we're going to trim one more time here. Ah, yes. And now, let's see how our scut look. Take a look all the way around the scut. There. 